Welcome to the Brew Crew Review Podcast, the show by fans for fans of your Milwaukee Brewers. Hi, Brewer fans. Welcome back to another Brew Crew Review Podcast. Uh, today, it's just me and Scott on, um, on the line here. And uh, Scott, how are you doing today? Uh, doing good, but, you know, I missed the other, you know, a little sad that the other half of the Brook Review couldn't make it today, but, you know, they're busy. I think Vince right now is um, scouting um, potential Brewer prospects in Kenya and Ethiopia. Uh, he said so far, um, not a lot of promising prospects. That's all he told me, so we'll see. Yeah, he said he was struggling to find a brewer bar. He did say there was a Packer bar in Ethiopia, though, so that's a little huh. uh, alarming, but uh, interesting. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so on with the the Brewers week. I know I predicted them to go 6-0 and this past week. I was a little bit optimistic. I, in hindsight, uh, right after I made that prediction, they did lose 16 to nothing to the Marlins, so that was probably uh, in retaliation uh, for me making that optimistic of a prediction. However, they did rebound, won the last game of the Marlins series, and then swept the Pirates, so they're currently on a four-game winning streak. They went 4-2 and two for the week. Um, I guess, uh, I don't know, you can have your overall thoughts, Scott, but I just want to point out that Mike Moustakis, that late off-season signing of Mike Moustakis, really, especially with Shaw's troubles, obviously, but Wow, what a huge signing and bargain for the Brewers. This guy's hitting home runs out of his mind and is a huge cog to our offense. What are your thoughts, Scott? Yeah, I think it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, to be able to sign him for for what we did and I guess, um, you know, once again for the second straight year, we thought he was going to get a big multi-year deal from somebody and it just didn't work out that way. And Brewers were able to get him on a, a very – very affordable contract. So it's really, really worked out. And like you said, um, I mean, Shaw's struggles have just compounded and, and made this um, signing even more uh, relevant because things would be really, really bad without him. I mean, the guy's already got, what, 20 homers? I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. And not only that, but he's hitting 275, which is pretty, uh, I think that's about 20, 25 points above his career norm. So, um, you know, the guy's just doing a great job and, just hope he can keep well, it going. I think the next offseason, he's not going to have as much trouble. Teams are definitely going to be interested in, uh, going forward after this season. He's playing together. Fortunately, I'm hoping he's not pricing himself out of the Brewers market for an extension. I know he did really kind of clamor to come back to Milwaukee because I think he enjoyed his uh, postseason run with the Brewers last year quite a bit. Um, and I, I don't know. Hopefully, there's some, you know, some hometown discount uh, possibility as far as just coming back to the Brewers uh, on a possible future multi-year deal because uh, I think we could definitely use them and possibly use Shaw as a trade bait or something to move on from him. But, I mean, uh, with that being said, Shaw is back at the big league level, and uh, we're hoping he rebounds as well as he will be a uh, Milwaukee Brewer for the time being. So, um, the other thing, also kudos once again to Kristen Yelich, who is, if I'm not mistaken, actually putting up around pace for better overall numbers than his 2018 MVP season, which is ludicrous in my mind. And uh, it's hard for me to believe he's that good of a player. I think he's on pace to uh, hit over 50 home runs or something like that. So uh, pretty ridiculous since he's hitting 330. Yeah. Not only that, Cody Bellinger has really fallen off the wayside. He's, he's down to hitting 355. So, and I, I'm only half joking about that, I guess, considering he's over 400 for most of the year. But um, it, it looks like Yelich, uh, I, don't, I don't know if he's necessarily the front runner right now, but he's got to be a top three candidate. And one guy the Brewers got to see this last weekend who's also having a huge breakout season. And uh, unfortunately, I'm jealous that you had drafted him in our fantasy league, Scott, but that's uh, Josh Bell of the Pirates. He leads the majors, I think, in extra base hits right now. He already has more extra base hits than he had all of last season, um, including 18 home runs. And, yeah, so – the Pir- he looks like a future middle order um, perennial MVP candidate for the Pirates, and I think they desperately need someone like that. Uh, luckily, we were able to suit them this past weekend anyways, and I know we have 
bunch more games against them, but a uh, big breakout season from him uh, for a division rival. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. When I drafted him, I just thought, hey, he's probably going to hit in the middle of the order. So, all right, let's give this guy a shot. I mean, he's, I'm like, if he's if they're like under 28 and they're going to hit in the middle of the order, I'm like, okay, yeah, that'll work. Let's we'll see what happens. Good call. I think you got him like in the 17th round of our keeper draft, so that's pretty good. Uh, anyway, moving on, talking about some more positivity from the Brewers. Uh, these guys that are contributing this year, um, another another player that's just unbelievably 7-0, and um, starting pitcher, Zach Davies. Um, he was a player who I struggled to even make our postseason roster and, you know, wasn't much part of our rotation last year. I know he did win 17 games for the Brewers, I believe, two seasons ago, but I don't think anyone saw this type of consistency coming from and basically just taking it to the next level um, in a career season out of Zach Davies. Um, do you think this is a for real, Scott, or for real breakout, or do you think he might come back down to earth uh, at some point as well? Um, well, I think it's probably somewhere in the middle, I, I guess. Um I mean, he hasn't ever had, like, a, a phenomenal breakout season yet. Um, having said that, you know, I don't think he's going to be able to keep his ERA under, like, two and a half for the course of an entire season. I hope I'm wrong there. But I think it's somewhere in the middle. He's obviously having a great year. Uh, he is really showing uh, his pinpoint control, and he's just got a devastating changeup, and he's using that more and more. And it's just uh, overall uh, just – really really great year and not only that but what's really important with it is between him and Woodruff we suddenly have two starters that uh, tend to be starting to go a lot deeper into games so we're not getting these five inning outings from a starting pitcher every day and then have to rely on our bullpen you know to cover four innings every game so uh, they're giving the bullpen a break and, and that's really really important keep those arms fresh um Absolutely. Uh, coming into this podcast, the Brewers are still tied for first place the Cubs. Um, I believe there's going to be a battle down, as we saw last season, all the way to the last game of the season, uh, hopefully with the Brewers prevailing once again like last year. Um, but this is definitely going to be a battle, and unfortunately our rivals did make a pretty significant move in the past week, signing uh, you know, a player that the Brewers were rumored to also have interest in after the news of Corey Knable going down uh, just before the season started. Um, and that was a uh, relief pitcher, Craig Kimbrell, um, formerly all-star closer. And uh, he did get a three-year deal uh, with the Cubs. Um, I believe $10 million is going to be owed to him for the rest of this season and 16 per for each of the next two seasons. So, um I think the Cubs got a fairly decent deal if uh, hopefully Kimbrell is rusty this year. But I think a move like that can kind of weigh the balance of what looks to be two teams that are pretty evenly matched uh, lineup pitching-wise and overall as a ball club. Um, what is your thoughts on this signing and uh, whether or not this really makes the Cubs the favors or the Brewers for the division or, or if the Brewers maybe have a move before the All-Star break to uh, – come back from that move from the Cubs. Well, to me anyway, Kimbrell is still a, obviously a very good pitcher, but the Cubs are kind of paying him based on what he's done, not what he will do. Um, you know, he's on the wrong side of 30 at this point. He's thrown a pretty good amount of innings and high leverage innings, so I, I'm not really sure. To me anyway, it, there's a little bit of desperation in this move by the Cubs. Their bullpen has been absolutely atrocious. Uh, they're lucky to be kind of where they are, and I don't know. I, I just think it's a it's a desperate team that at this point is just doing what they can uh, to try to hang with the Brewers. Um, you know, there's there's a fan base that's a little bit disappointed in how we uh, took the division from them last year, and then their their quote, playoff uh, run last year uh, only lasted one game. So um, it's a it's definitely something where you know they they're trying to get good and they're trying to do it as fast as they can and just trying to tread water and hang with us. Yeah, um, I don't disagree with the fact that you um, mentioned that Kimbrell is definitely trending toward the downside of his career and he's not as reliable as he once was. With that being said, there's no doubt that adding Kimbrell to the Cubs roster definitely solidifies the back end of their bullpen 
that's definitely been a problem area, not just this year, but in past years, uh, since they lost Wade Davis, the free agency, I, I just don't think, um, and, and Cub fans have seen even back when they would, did win the World Series a few years back, they, their acquisition uh, late in the season of Chapman um, really kind of put them over the top, so to speak. So this is definitely a positive move for their club, unfortunately for the Brewers. With that being said, um, the Brewers' bullpen is hanging in their, their own right, but uh, it's definitely taking a step back from last season. Obviously, when you start off the year losing – Corey Knable, who has just completely lights out the last two months of last year into the postseason, and then Jeremy Jeffers, who started off the season injured and really has not quite been himself, his dominant self of last season. That's two huge pieces of their, you know, three-headed back of the rotation or back of the bullpen monster that included, of course, Josh Hader. We're still left with the one monster that is Josh Hader, who's still awesome, uh, possibly best closer in baseball or best relief pitcher, period, in baseball. Uh, the Brewers have been using him in almost a traditional closer's role with the caveat that he's able to go multiple innings if need be, which is awesome. But are you a little surprised at all the Brewers haven't talked about sliding maybe Jeremy Jeffers back in that closer role and having um, Josh Hader go back to the role that made him so effective and helped the Brewers the postseason last year in that uh, kind of floating back of the bullpen fireman type role? Um, obviously, he's valuable wherever you put him, but uh, do you agree with his – usage I guess this year um I I definitely think that I I preferred him in that fireman role but it was because I had complete confidence in whoever was coming in after him that they were going to be able to shut him down um I don't necessarily have that with Jeffers yet this year that doesn't mean that I won't at some point but um for me anyway that's kind of where I'm at it's sort of like Corey Knebel in like what April May of last year versus Corey Knebel in September, October of last year. Um, I just didn't have the confidence in him early in the year, and then by the end of the year he was back and he was just lights out, and it was absolutely phenomenal. I do want to say about uh, Craig Kimbrell, I'm like, I really hope that this is like their next Tyler Chatwood. I don't think that's going to happen. but um, Or even like the Cardinals uh, signing of, what, Greg Holland? Um which, by the way, the Cardinals yeah. are under 500 as of this taping. It's kind of interesting. Just wanted to point that out. But um, having said that, I don't think that it's going to be – the Kimbrel signing is not going to be anything like those uh, two really, really bad signings. But I, I also don't think that they just signed their version of Hater in Kimbrel. I, I don't think that Kimbrel is that guy anymore. Yeah. And uh, Hayter has a couple of key home runs this year, but besides that, he's just been unbelievable when he comes in and uh, racking up the saves. And not only that, but those super valuable, almost uh, one plus, almost up to inning saves that he's been able to do. Really valuable to the back end of the bullpen. Uh, the rest of our bullpen is really kind of in flux still. Uh, we've tried out a lot, bunch of guys that just did not work out, like Alex Wilson and our younger guys that I thought would take a step forward, you know, Taylor Williams and Jacob Barnes have not done that. Corbin Burns has been gone from rotation where he's terrible to the bullpen where he's also been terrible. That's not helping things. Um, overall, there's other players that I want to think that the Brewers, just if they can make some internal improvements, can get better on their own and, and, and they're not firing all cylinders yet. When you talk about Chassin maybe improving on his pretty back number so far, even at I think there's a better version of Chase Anderson we could still see. Uh, Freddie Peralta, I think, you know, has that – he always shows that brilliance in some outings and then he, you know, gets blown up at the beginning of other outings. I still think that he's got a high ceiling and he could really I, – I hope that they give him an opportunity to get some more uh, starts at the MLB level because I really think that he could be key internal addition if he really has a breakout uh, at the – you know, during the season. So, with all that being said, I did want to – we haven't really kind of avoided this issue on former podcast, but at this point, the overall team ERA, if you combine the rotation and the bullpen, it's, I believe, close to two runs higher overall than the Brewers' 2018 staff, which is obviously a huge strength. Um, that's a problem, and you've got to start to look at it now as the departure of – 
uh, former pitching coach um, Derek Johnson, DJ as they call him, um, has had to have some effect. He obviously is now the pitching coach with the Reds. Um, he's had to have some, unfortunately, negative effect on the Brewers um, going from 2018 to 2019. Do you agree or disagree with that statement, Scott? Um, I, I would definitely say that, that Derek Johnson was a huge loss for us, and I think that definitely some of that uh, could be attributed to it. I, I wonder to a much, much less extent if – um, maybe Manny Pena calling games versus Grandal, if that does anything, like if he if he calls a better game than him or not. Um, it's really hard for me to say, but Grandal brings so much offensively to the table that it, you know, it's really hard to complain about that, I guess. And the other thing I kind of wanted to mention is um, the Cincinnati Reds last year, their pitching was fairly atrocious. And, um, in fact, their bullpen has been – historically bad for uh the last couple of years and right now they're sitting like uh just their pitching staff in general is sitting fourth in uh fourth in the majors in era so i mean i think when you factor uh the brewers pitching woe is couple that with the vast improvement of reds pitching you got to think that Derek johnson is involved yeah unfortunately he did go to division rival but um it was a big loss. I think Brewer fans kind of don't know about it or kind of overlook some some of them. But uh, unfortunately, it is what it is. And I know our new pitcher coach, Chris Hook, I actually don't know a ton about him. But um, obviously, with the change, um, you'd think anything that was taught to these pitchers by Derek Johnson, you know, doesn't like it gets unlearned as soon as he leaves, so to speak. So I would hope he did get to work with the majority of players on our staff. But there, I think – when it comes to, like, Shasin, I think it was just one of those things where he had a career year last year and pitched above his talent, so to speak. And I think he's just coming back down to uh, earth a little bit. Um, Gio Gonzalez is, you know, he's a veteran. He's not looked all that great. Um, it's just the main regression that concerns me is uh, Corbin Burns, um, I guess. Um, and I'm really hoping – I thought he would be the best of the three – the three young pitchers that we always talked about with uh, Peralta and Woodruff all kind of entering the league at the same time. Um, but that's, he seems to be the worst of the three at this point. And, uh, you know, I hope he can really turn around because I still see that he's got a great skill set and that uh, with a little bit of refinement of his control and overall, I think he could rebound and he'd be a huge addition to our bullpen or possibly future starting rotation as well. But as of right now, um, definitely, um, I think we're feeling the effects of that. And somehow the Brewers are still in first place, like 10 games over 500. And uh, for the first time this season, I believe, they've reached that mark. And, you know, I, I think that they can make some improvements uh, by using their farm system, their strength to, to make some trades and improve the big league club this trade deadline season. And I believe that that's going to happen. Don't know where it'll come from, but I still think, in spite of any of those outside additions, I think internally Brewers really still have to improve. And uh, those those young pitchers, you know, Woodruff has been having a great season. He's got to keep that up. But we also need to have, you know, better performance out of Peralta, Burns, and definitely Shasin. I mean, um, he's got to come pitch at least somewhat closer to how he pitched to us last year because he's just not getting it done right now. Um, so what can you do? So um, looking forward, the Brewers uh, from now until the All-Star break still have a fairly easier schedule compared to the first six weeks of the year. I know we've uh, mentioned this before, but um, this week uh, they get to play, well, it's a up and down roller coaster as far as quality. We, we played two games in Houston. We got the Astros who are pretty much the best team in baseball. And then we go out to San Francisco for three games on the weekend against the Giants, who could be arguably the worst team in baseball. So um, I know we have to face Verlander, I believe, on Wednesday, and then uh, Bumgarner maybe on Sunday. I'm not sure, but so we still have some good pitchers to get through. But this week, um, I'll go ahead and predict that we go again optimistically four and one. I think we'll lose one to Houston and hopefully sweep the Giants. But uh, what are your thoughts on the upcoming schedule, Scott? Uh, it's on the road. Houston's uh, Houston's a very good team. 
The Giants are not. One thing good. about before you make a prediction, Scott, I just want to point out that, and the Brewers fans also, the Brewers are hitting their ass with a kind of a nice time. Uh, not only are they going to avoid their best pitcher, Derek Cole, in this short series, but they're also um, – the Astros are currently without three – their three best players offensively, and that's Altuve, um, Carlos Correa, both still injured, and also George Springer, who was having quite the season before he went on. Yeah. And so that's kind of a good time to be hitting. With that being said, they just brought up a huge top prospect, Jordan Alvarez, this weekend, so that doesn't help. But overall – I think that this is a good time to be playing them, I guess. Yeah, and I still a little bit of my thunder there, especially because I was like, oh, well, two-thirds of those Astros players are on my fantasy team, and I play you this week. So uh, you also couldn't pick a better time to play me, I guess. <laughs> but um, having said that, I guess, um, I don't know, it's pretty hard to sweep anybody on the road, no matter how bad they are or how good you are. I'm just going to say three and two. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for four one there, but I, I I just have a feeling one of them is going to get away from us. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll stick with three and two, and then yeah, after that, like you were saying, um, kind of a weak schedule. Uh, three at the Padres, um, four at the Reds, or I'm sorry, four at home against the Reds, and um, with that. The Reds aren't a bad team. They're only six games under 500, but they're in last in our division. So, I mean, they're obviously not super, super great. Then we play three against the um, at home against the Mariners, who are already saying that they are punting the season. And then three oh, more against awful. the Pirates. Yeah. So, so, yeah, like you're saying, it's we got to make a little bit of ground here because all these games, we're going to be real, real happy that we win them, you know, come September. Absolutely. So, um, and I know all star fan voting has already started, and uh, I got to believe that we got to have a few really uh, players that are candidates to be all stars again this year. Obviously, probably the main shoe ends at this point would be uh, two of the best players in baseball, period. And that's obviously Christian Yelich and Josh Hader. I almost think that those guys got to be shoe ends. Um, and then, depending on, you know, obviously every team has that representative, uh, there'll be more time to talk about this as we get closer. There's still a month of the All-Star break, but um, but yeah, I think the Brewers will be well represented and, and rightfully so. I mean, um, they're a great team. Uh, I just, I'm really hopeful that they're they're in the driver's seat to make the playoffs once again this year. Yeah, definitely uh, same sentiment here. I mean, so far anyway, um, you, you kind of feel like this team hasn't played their best baseball yet, and you know they're still sitting here in first place in the Central. So. Um, you know, you've really got to like, got to be like being in the catbird seat, I guess, so to speak. Well, if you think about the fact that we, we've got to get better production out of Jesus Aguilar, we've got to get product, any some production out of Travis Shaw, and then uh, we also have Kesson Hero back in the minor leagues. Uh, between the majors and minors this year, he's got 18 home runs and uh, tons of RBIs. Um, so he's a huge bat that we're going to be able to add back to our the big league club, no doubt, before the playoff stretch. Uh, and we're definitely going to fit him in the lineup in some capacity. So uh, that's good to know. So, I mean, like I said, we got some internal ways to improve. But, I mean, obviously Aguilar's got a hit. Um, Shaw's got a hit to even be on the roster. Um, some other players, you know, got to even stay healthy. Like, I think Braun is a huge wild card, uh, veteran wild card that bats always valuable once it's in there. But again, he's got to stay on the field. And then just overall, we've got to find some solidification of our bullpen. Uh, hopefully, Jeffers steps up. I'm not super confident there's other pieces that we have in that bullpen that are really more than what they are. I mean, Matt Elbers and Matt Elbers. But, I mean, overall, I think that could be somewhere where we look to make an addition, obviously, during the, during the trade the trading season as well. But we shall see uh, what Stearns has uh, up, up his sleeve for us. So, Oh. Yeah, for me, uh, I think it really all – it all begins with the first base position. I mean, Aguirre has been just so bad this year compared to how good he was last year. Um, and I just remember last year thinking that we had um, – I think we had more – we were probably a top five team as far as, like, getting production out of the first base position. And this year we, we've got to be a bottom five for sure. So, I mean, Thames is – 
he's shown some flashes, but hasn't really, uh, really put it all together yet either. So I don't know. That's, that's where the offense can improve because I mean, other than that, our offense is actually pretty solid, but when I look at it also, I'm like, oh, we're middle of the pack in the majors and hitting as well. So, you know, just got to. Well, if you think of, the, think of the fact that the move should probably slot back in, in that third and hero would be a second once he gets called back up, that leaves three potential players to cover you in some form of platoon or whatever, a production out of Aguiar, um, Shaw, and um, Thames, I mean, two of those three guys have got to cover first base. I'm just hopeful that one or two of them will, you know, find their groove, um, so to speak, and be valuable to us so that we don't have to make an outside the organization acquisition at that position. So I feel that I think we'll be okay there. And obviously we're covering the outfield. The other thing is we just have to continue to stay healthy. Our offense players have really been able to stay pretty healthy overall outside of Braun, uh, and I think that needs to continue uh, for us to be, uh, you know, to win this division once again. So, um, yeah, so we'll see. But I think a couple of huge wild cards in our success are going to be players like Braun and guys like Freddie Peralta, who I think can, you know, take it to the next level, give him the opportunity. And hopefully, you know, he should get a, another couple of starts to maybe show himself before Chassin gets healthy and whatever. But, uh, oh, also another huge wild card that we didn't even mention. And welcome back, Jimmy Nelson, who pitched his first game in the big leagues in nearly two years this past week. Uh, we personally did not win that game against the Marlins, but overall it's great to have him back. And he's, again, a, a true wild card in the sense that uh, you just don't know where we're going to get from him and how many innings he's going to be able to pitch this year. And if we do make the postseason, if he's going to be able to pitch deep into it, or whether or not he'll be my full fan. Either way, happy to have Jimmy back, and hopefully they can, you know, find this former form that he found out in his breakout year in 2017 before getting injured. And uh, he's definitely a huge piece to this team going forward for sure. Yeah, and for what it's worth, I mean, what positive takeaways did you have from the start? I mean, just getting back to the mound is is obviously the the best positive of all. But um, I was really impressed that his velocity seemed to be back. So that. That definitely helps. Yeah, I think it's just more of getting the innings under his belt. And, and this is a good stretch this season to get him to get those in for him at the major league level. Obviously, he's been the minor leagues for a couple of weeks getting some innings in, but I think getting some major league innings in and getting his control and command um, back. Yeah, obviously, it's nice to see his velocity back, but I think overall um, that's the main concern I have. And then, you know, just the durability, I, you know, whether or not he can build up his pitch count so that he can go five, you know, five, six, seven innings rather than barely five or whatever until he gets his legs underneath him or his arms, so to speak. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing more of him. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, again, uh, this is going to have to wrap up this podcast. So remember, everyone left out, stay classy. And, and uh, yeah. Go Brewers. Go Brewers. Dinner, dinner. I was just filling in for All right. There.